This chapter is called On Animals, Men and Robots, and as I mentioned, we're going to be using the knowledge that we've gained, especially in 3 and 4, and I want to emphasize, as the reading especially, there's a lot of deep stuff in there. Let yourself understand what you can and come back to it later. After we've done this, you'll have a much better idea of what the meanings of these things are. We're going to investigate questions that probably everybody's asked at one time or another. Specifically, what, uh, what is an animal? Does an animal think? What is man? Will a robot ever be able to think? What is a robot? Are there other thinking beings besides man? And we proved in the existence of God at the end of the last chapter, besides man and God. Can animals think? Well, again, we come up to the issue of making proper distinctions. What do you mean by think? Well, you know, there's a researcher who's studied this gorilla named Coco, who, who has apparently something over a thousand uh, sign, knows over a thousand signs, and can supposedly speak in sign language. There's another example of um, a young student of mine who told me that her cat would ring the doorbell when it wanted to come in. So we have to say, well, if this is what we mean by thinking, then obviously they think. But if you're more precise about it, we now know how to make the proper distinctions. There's sensorial knowledge and there's intellectual knowledge. The real question is, when you mean think, you mean think in the deepest way, which is with ideas. Do they have an intellect is the question we really want to ask specifically. Can they apprehend the form of the thing as the form of the thing in its generality is the question we want to know. If so, they should be able to do science, not science in the general sense, but in, in the sense of the science before science. That is, asking the questions relative to essence. What is that? Like a child asks, what is that? Why is a bad man bad? Why is the sky blue? Those sorts of questions were what we mean by science in the general sense, this science before science. We do not find among animals in the wild anything like the, this tendency. Let's um, uh, uh, try to analyze this. We'll notice that not doing science in this sense is just short of a proof. Why? Well, it's just short of a proof, I'm sorry, that they don't have intellect. Why? Well, let's assume that they have an intellect and go from there. Well, since we don't see the evidence, there must be some kind of block that makes the, the, the fact that they have it not seen. There's two types of blocks, a physical or a non-physical, material or non-material. A physical block is such as having, not having an opposable thumb. Well, you know, like monkeys have sort of opposable appendages, so they don't have a, a capable of, of opposable thumb. Um, but you should still see some rudimentary evidence. I mean, we have the example of Stephen Hawking, who's a world-renowned physicist who can't hardly move anything, and nonetheless is still a world-renowned physicist. Of course, um, he, you know, he gradually had the onset of this illness, so he could learn things. But the point is, is that when, so, when a man is in this condition, he lets you know that he's a man. Um, stroke, another potential thing is what um, one of these researchers called the st stroke victim analogy, and that is uh, specifically Coco's trainer, Francine Patterson suggested, Patterson suggested this. She says that, um, that, you know, like when you have a stroke, somebody has a stroke, they can not speak as clear and not think as clear. Maybe this is the conditions of all animals. Well, of course, this sort of total block would make animals rather absurd creatures because that would mean that their, in, their main power, their intellectual power, their chief power is their least effectual power. So, this seems rather absurd, the conclusion to draw. In the case of a man having a stroke, well, you know he's a man, and you know this is a particular man, it's not all men, it's not the nature of man uh, to be this way. This seems absurd. Another possibility is an immaterial block, and this, is, this would mean a decision, not just a decision by one animal, but all animals, not to use their intellects, not to manifest their intellect um, by use in any real way. Well, this, of course, is even more absurd because it's like saying that the chief power decides to not use itself. It's sort of suicide. It's not even clear you can do such a thing, that, that you would end up doing it sort of spontaneously even when you didn't want to do it because it's your, of your nature, after all. It's, second. it's what, what happens because of who you are and what you are. So common sense certainly backs up this idea that animals don't have intellect. 
animals in the wild or otherwise do not perform uni uniquely human actions associated with the intellect. None of them are engineers, artists, musicians, teachers, com comedians, priests, actors, doctors, lawyers, politics. You don't see any of this. You don't see any political environment set up. Um, as uh, Chesterton once said, you don't see, you see in human architects, uh, you have a romance period and a Baroque period and so on. A bird's nest, a, a sparrow's nest 500 years ago is the same as it was, um, as it is now. There's no different stages of sparrow's nests. There is not this, any of these things manifested in animals, either in the wild or in captivity. So it sure seems that they don't have intellects, but let's, let's prove it. Let's bring it home. Let's make sure that they don't, make sure we haven't missed anything. Let's start with the orangutans, and let's analyze some of the special science evidence. The special science um, of this animal psychology that, the, that, for example, Dr. Anne Roussan did with orangutans, where she viewed orangutans that were released into the wild after having spent a lot of time with humans. And they were observed chopping firewood, washing laundry and dishes, sawing logs, sharpening axes. One even tried to start a fire. She said they had never rehearsed these behaviors. She said it was as if they were playing back mental videos. Remember that. That's an important statement she made there. Another one is this um, gorilla you may have seen on TV. Um, there were several PBS specials on this gorilla named Coco. Here you see... Supposedly, the gorilla is signing for a cookie, which means uh, something to eat. How can we explain these things? Well, let's eliminate the intellectual power completely. And, and the way we need to do that is look to see whether animals have ideas. Because if they have ideas, then they have these just power of understanding generalities, then they have the immaterial power we're talking about. Now, to do this, we need to investigate language, because language is the manifestation of our intellects. Words are associated with things or ideas. And there's two way, ways of learning ideas. One is the direct association way, like when you're little, your mother points to that animal and says, that's a dog. And that's how you learn what a dog is. You know, the word, I mean, you learn what a dog is by the act of abstraction, but you learn the associate, association of the word dog with that animal. The other method is when your mother teaches you when you're little or your teacher teaches you the, the, what I call the, dic by the dictionary method. And that is, she might say, the North Pole, what is that? That's the spot where the axis of rotation of the Earth pokes up through the Northern Hemisphere. So when it spins, there's an axis, and say the Northern Hemisphere is where the United States is, or where Europe is. And that's a definition that you get by... Um, without having to see the North Pole itself. You can just imagine this. And I give another example in the book of a, of a, of a wallet, which I um, encourage you to read. But the point here is, is that the dictionary method is a method by instrumental signs. This is the key method. Um, and remember, an, an instrumental sign is that which is something, but takes on a referential value that you assign it. Like a stop sign is an is a instrumental sign. Remember, ideas, on the other hand, are pure signs. They're pure referential things. They're pure meaning. If animals can transfer meaning, then they have ideas. We have to be careful, though, because we have to be making the distinction between this transfer of meaning and just a material association, a sensorial association. We talked about you can sort circles without understanding what a circle is. For example, if I bring my son his bike and tell him that it is a vehicle, and then tell him that a vehicle is a device for anthropoid locomotion, does that mean that, he that if he's able to say, uh, associate this set of words with a bicycle, that he understands what those words mean and what a vehicle is? No. That's what, what the animal psychologists would call signal ability. It's stimulus response. doesn't mean you understand it. It just means you've associated this set of words with the object, because the object was in front of you. The object, and you pointed to the object, and you associated this set of words and that set of words with the same object. The glass or, or the cup, whatever 
would all be associated with that object. It would be a sensorial association. Using abstract ideas that are not picturable is, is what we really want to get at. For example, the idea of an idea or the idea of God. None of those ideas are picturable. So if we can get the transfer of those ideas, it would even be more, um, it would be, that would be the, the complete proof if you saw that kind of transfer that, that the animal had uh, an intellect. Can animals transfer meaning by the dictionary method? Despite research, immense research, there is no evidence whatsoever that they can. A renowned, the renowned philosopher, the late philosopher Mortimer Adler, who was a profound philosopher, understood Aristotle and St. Thomas completely and studied the neuropsychology, of for, watched it for over 45 years, um, was one of the many people that you can reference on this to say that there's no evidence for that sort of transfer. All animal behavior then can be explained by sensorial knowledge. How do we explain it specifically though? Well, what is sensorial knowledge? Sensorial knowledge is the awareness of particulars by the use of phantasms. Note some behavior can be accounted for by just simple stimulus response type behavior. But uh, let's look at some examples here. Apes can ape human activity just as Dr. Rusan said. In advanced sensorial knowledge, not only do you have the ability to make images whereby you become in a particular way and uh, the thing, for example, I become the coldness of the glass, but also I can remember those images and, and manipulate them and recall them in order if I want and not manipulate them at all. So I can effectively, as Dr. Rusan says, run the video backwards. They don't need to understand, they can just run the video backwards. For example, take the case of the cat ringing the doorbell. The, the cat associated the need to go in, for example, because he's hungry or wants food, or wants uh, some warmth because it's cold outside. The, the sensorial knowledge of the door opening was triggered this association, and he basically went through the activity that he knew was again associated with the opening of the door. Opening of the door is associated with getting warm. Ringing of the doorbell is associated with opening the door. So there doesn't have to be an understanding, even an awareness. These things could be actually explained mechanically, but it, it is clear though, nonetheless, that cats and apes are aware, that they're aware of their surroundings. And so this sensorial knowledge gives them the capability of of, under, of being, understanding the particular, but not the general. Coco shows that advanced sensorial knowledge can do. The more sensory ability that an animal has, the more it can do. Dolphins, for example, are been told, uh, it's been said, can distinguish uh, a different circles, even though they're colored differently and, and different sizes. Um, but this is just, again, of the sorting ability, this of taking an image and the, the image as long as the image is something, in, the object is something in front of them, they can color the images in their mind and compare it and make the identifications if it's associated with something like food uh, that, that their bodily needs are responding to. And it's interesting to watch Coco because Coco many times <laughs> will be in the middle of something, will sign something having to do with food and ignore what supposedly he's being asked. But sensorial knowledge is a very powerful thing and it can mimic and because of our ha possessing it's very easy for us to assign it without if we're not careful and one example is this so-called clever clever hans phenomena where it's named this is phenomenon is named after a horse clever hans who i have my suspicions started the whole uh the old very old series called um mr ed but this horse uh what that's neither here nor there because th this horse supposedly could add multiply spell read and it fooled the renowned psychologist the world round. It was quite a sensation at the early part of the 20th century. And this is very well known in, um, animal among animal psychologists. It later was found that the horse, what was happening is the sensorial knowledge is so powerful in a horse that the horse was taking cues from pulling in all this sensorial information and taking the subtlest clue from the animal and the trainer and responding in the way that it was expected to to get the reward it expected. And nobody, nobody was deliberately perpetrating this hoax. This was just the horse had been trained so well 
and its sensorial knowledge capabilities were advanced enough that it could do these things. So the only plausible explanation is that animals are living things with sensorial knowledge. So you might ask, are animals self-aware? Again, it depends on what you mean. In the primary sense, and, and, and that means aware of its ability to be aware, aware of its ability to know, the answer is no. Why? Because an animal only knows by phantasm. Hence, it only can know particulars. It can know this particular lectern and this particular table, this particular cup, this particular apple. But if it were to know those things, not just in their generality as a general apple, but as, per as particular instances of a general thing called knowledge, then it would have ideas. And that's precisely what it, we say it doesn't have. So with only phantasms, it cannot be aware of itself as a self. It can be, on the other hand, it can be aware of its body and its particular unified set of actions because it can do something and it has the ability of using phantasms. It can put together all the different things that it's doing in one image of what it's doing and it can have uh, an awareness of its body, but not as a, an awareness of itself as knowing. Because of this ability, though, of being aware of its body, higher animals such as an ape can ape self-awareness. Note though the important thing here to note is the qualitative difference between having an intellect and not having an intellect. You cannot have a, a, a million instances of sensorial knowledge turn into intellectual knowledge. There's a qualitative difference. You can't add up a lot of sensorial knowledge to get intellectual knowledge. There is a difference of kind, not degree, between intellectual and sensorial knowledge. Animals are living things. The subject itself was greatly enhanced by Aristotle who classified over 500 organisms. Darwin called him, and I paraphrase, the best biologist of all time. And when he found Darwin, he, he said, um, I mean, when Darwin found him, he, he had rejected some of his earlier heroes in favor of Aristotle. St. Albert the Great was another great biologist and the teacher of St. Thomas. And so these things that we're talking about, about animals are a natural way of understanding and not only just learning about the animals themselves but deepening our broader philosophical base. Aristotle identified four primary abilities of living things. The nutritive, the locomotive, the sensorial, and the intellectual. Man has all of them. So what is an animal? Animals have sensorial power and thus an appetitive power, but not an intellectual power. An appetitive power meaning that once the senses are aware of something, then there's an instinct that kicks in that is called the appetite. And that judges the sensorial powers have an aspect to them. That the sensorial powers are actually many powers, but there's one part of those powers that decides whether the thing is good for the animal or bad for it. If it's bad, if it's evil, if it's poison, for example, the animal recoils from it. If it's dangerous to it, it recoils. The appetite gives a, gives a repulsion. Otherwise, if it's good, the appetite gives an attraction. The animal is attracted to it. Also has a vegetative, um, for sensual knowledge, cannot occur without nutritive light, life. Because the vegetative is the way an organism maintains itself, and the sensorial knowledge requires the organism to exist before being able to know things. So the nutritive life is sort of the lowest form of life, that, but an animal needs that to build on its sensorial knowledge. In order for an animal to be an organism, that is to be organized, for it to be a real unity, and thus to be, remember unity and being are interchangeable to the degree something is unified the degree, is the degree that it is, Thus, these things must all work together. The vegetative, the sensorial, must somehow work together. The vegetative is subordinated to the sensorial. The sensorial then implicitly contains the vegetative. As we said, to use the sensorial knowledge, you have to have the organism existing. You have to have the maintain maintenance of the organism, and if need be, the growth of the organism, which is what the vegetative part does. Organi the relative parts of the organism works towards keeping the or organism an organism, keeping it alive. So the animal part subsumes the vegetative part. The animal part raises up the vegetative part to be an animal. 
When I eat the apple, I raise the vegetative parts of the animal into the parts of me. Now, in addition, if we wanted to find an animal, we notice that animals generally have locomotion. Why is this? Well, because animals are beings with sensorial powers, material beings with sensorial powers. Well, sensorial powers requires, if you will, a light touch. In order to be in contact with things, you have to be open to them. So if my skin was made out of bark, I couldn't feel the glass. And plants tend to have this protective outer coating because they don't have sensorial knowledge. But animals tend to have, if you feel the surface of a frog, as Aristotle points out, you feel the slime. That's because he has sensorial powers. And that, but that openness to the world makes them vulnerable. So typically animals have to be able to move to get away when there's a danger. When they sense a danger, they need to get away. And like a plant who has built-in armor, sort of, if you would like. An animal, then, is a living organism with the capacity for sensorial knowledge. That, that is our definition of animal. You might now ask, what is a plant? Well, we can answer that pretty quickly. A plant is a living organism with nutritive powers only. Only the power to maintain itself. Heterogeneous parts ordered eminently for the action of the whole to survive, without sensorial, without intellectual powers. Now, I will use these, these divisions or philosophical divisions, which are the foundational divisions, what the things really are. The biological mode of explanation is qu qualitatively different than the philosophical mode, at least in its modern form. So we have to make a distinction here. The word plant is also used in biology. I will use um, the Latinization, plant, animalia and plantae, to, to mean the bi biological classifications. And it so happens that the biological classification for animal includes um, only animals in it, but there are other things that are animals that are classified outside of that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But, you know, there are going to be things that are on the borderline that you're going to have to figure out whether they actually have sensorial knowledge or not. And um, I'll show a video here of, you know, these, these, this word means animals without that have nuclei with no membranes around them. So this is one of the simplest forms of life. They might not be, they can move around, so it, there's an indication that they sense things, and they seem to sense things, as you'll see in the video. But, you know, pro, the, actually I don't show one of those, I show a, a protista. And the protista, you already wonder whether they're aware. They probably are, when you'll see the video, you'll see that they probably are aware. Now a slug, they're showing you that there's different degrees of... Uh, sensorial knowledge. A slug has sensorial knowledge, but it may have not have the ability to recall it. It may not be able to think back and have dreams, for example. Animals that have advanced sensorial knowledge can have dreams because they can have those images come back in their own, in, in, sort of randomly. Whereas lower animals, say you, you're convinced, I'm sure, that a protista has no uh, recollection of its sensorial knowledge, but it may in a vague way the, I mean, it may be vaguely aware of vague things. The simplest forms of life, you'll have to decide whether they're animals or not, and um, it won't necessarily be what their biological classification is. Because their biological classification is done for different reasons. There's a different mode of explanation. Sensorial knowledge is capable of more than current animals can do. Monkeys can make rudimentary tools, umbrellas, chairs, things that, that Dr. Rousson and others have seen more advanced animals could make fires or spears. There's not, they don't have to understand what a spear or fire is to do it. They just have to have had um, these sensorial, uh, advanced enough sensorial understanding to be able to put the particulars together and say accidentally have started a fire by hitting a rock against a, um, another rock and then, then replay that in their image, in their image, you know, their DVD in their head, if you will. So the, another thing to note here is that, so that's one thing to note, is that sensorial knowledge has potentially much more capability even than what we see. And the next thing to note is that we had a qualitative jump from plant to animal. Animal to man is another qualitative jump. Here we went from not sensorial knowledge, from no element of immateriality to a partial element of materiality, to an element uh, where one part of it is completely immaterial. And, and, sen and man can abstract the essence of a thing from his sensorial knowledge. Sensorial knowledge is included in the intellectual. Intellectual includes the sensorial. So the, uh, um, 
the way to think of it is that you have this hierarchy of things, one thing subsuming the other. And the example St. Thomas gives is how a triangle includes a square. Say this is the intellect. Sensorial knowledge is made up of inside, is implicitly contained inside the square. So sensorial knowledge, uh, the vegetative takes over the material world, brings it up to the vegetative so it's an organized whole acting towards the, uh, eminently for the preservation of the whole. Then the sensorial knowledge brings the vegetative up so that it's awareness of particulars used, using and um, bringing up the vegetative. And then on top of that, the intellectual knowledge um, incorporates all the rest of them. So you have this hierarchy of one included inside the other. So the recap. The substantial form of man is called called the soul is immaterial because man's intellect is. Intellect is because we have ideas which are general, not particular. Remember, matter is particular, so it could not be material. It had to be immaterial. Recall material things are form matter composites. This apple is an apple, but it potentially is part of me. It has an is part, a form part, and um, a potential part called matter. The animal's substantial form has sensorial and vet and vegetative powers, as we've said, the vegetative powers make use of the physical laws, do not violate them. In the same way the vegetative laws are made use of by the sensorial knowledge, they do not violate them. They try to bring them up and make use of them. They're not something that grabs sort of, it's the difference between a dictator and a benevolent king. A dictator would grab and use and, and not use the power of the, thing below, of the people below, but would manipulate and try to control, whereas these subsume and bring up, raise the level of, the being below it. This brings up the question of physical laws. And, and if you're in the sciences or done the sciences at all, you know that the sciences are couched in terms of laws. There's a law of inertia, there's a law of, of gravity, there's a law of Maxwell's equations and so forth. Laws of quantum mechanics. Well, now just, I want you to remember that unity and being are interchangeable because man is a being a unity, there must be an order between his various powers, and we've already talked about that order. The more order, the more he is. The less order, the less he is. Thus, there must be one power that regula regu regulates, orchestrates, if you will, all the others. It's like an orchestra, and the orchestra has to have a leader, or at the very least, someone who, who writes the music and who put, sets up a metronome. There is something regulating power. If one power is completely independent, and not governed by the other powers, then it's no longer a part of the thing. So you have to keep in mind that there must be some regulation order among the things to the degree the thing is. Of course, if the thing is partially ordered, then it partially is. Just like an orchestra that doesn't quite play together would still be partially to the degree that it does play together, maybe very badly, but it would still be an orchestra. Again, the less in order his powers, the less the man he is. Intellect is the chief power because it is the most, because it is immaterial. How does the being of, the sub, of man subsume the physical laws then? That's particularly what our problem is here. Because we have these laws of nature that we want to see how they work with the sensorial and intellectual powers. Knowledge comes with a correlative power. Remember we said sensorial knowledge comes with the internal sense, the evaluative power, and the appetitive power. Power. The evaluative power, remember, it decides whether something is bad for the organism, and if it is, it repels it, and if it's good, then it attracts it. The appetitive power attracts it. Um, intellectual knowledge comes with the appetitive power called the will. The will is nothing but the attraction that you feel when something that you perceive, when you see that it's good. Or if it's evil, you pull away from it. The will perceives what the intellect learns. So, no particular good, by the way, um, can uh, overwhelm the will. The will can always choose because no particular good is so absolute in, in the material world that it can overwhelm and change the, uh, and cause the will to have an, you know, un irresistible attraction. So this is the, the free will. And the free will is a primary data in the experience. I'm not trying to demonstrate its existence. It's something you know of immediately by your experience that you have free will. But the fact is, is that this is what the free will is. It's the appetitive power of the intellect, whereby once you know something, 
You're, you decide whether it's good or bad, and then the, intellect, the will is either attracted or repelled by it. So, here's the problem in a nutshell. The physical laws versus the, um, the laws of the higher powers of the vegetative and sensorial, and especially the intellect. And in particular, the will. It's physical versus the will. How can you have these laws, Maxwell's equations and so forth, that act in a certain way, but yet the will, will can come by and do whatever it wants? The problem comes really from the incorrect placement of the sciences. We saw that right from the beginning in the first chapters where we talked about the motion of the earth, where we said the motion of the earth is not, uh, I mean, the motion of the earth around the sun is not primary. We don't know that first. We know that second. If we start at the top of the tree instead of the bottom, we get in all kinds of trouble. So lots of this has to do with where we start. We want to start at the ground and build up. We want to start with wh what is more known and move to what is less known. But we can answer the, nonetheless, we can answer the question with what we've got so far. It will be more completed in chapter 6, when we, that's the next chapter, when we um, talk about the placement of the sciences. So two questions, though, about man's soul that this, this whole issue brings up. How will it regulate the phys physical powers, and how can it do it without violating material causality? Well, the regulation of the powers we've talked about some. We have, in this, and this is a metaphor of the train. And remember, be careful with images. They can, be, they can help you to think, but they aren't the thinking itself. We have here the senses, which is where we bring in our knowledge, we reason about it, and we decide, and, that, and that's the, the train, the engine that pulls the train. Our emotions are the fuel. When we have something that we like, we get, that, get attracted toward it, and we go towards it. And everything else is behind that. The will controls the low, lower powers by imminent action. So let me give you an example. The fireman saving the life of a woman doesn't change the nature of his instinctive revulsion of fire. He uses it from, to help him from getting burnt. If he didn't still have that healthy fear of fire, the, the fear no longer, like, like it would an animal, will make him run away, but it will make him now keep, uh, be wary of where the fire is and where it isn't and stay away from it so he can save the woman and um, do the necessary thing to save the woman, and that is to keep himself from dying and serious injury. So this is the difference, the eminent action versus external action. The form matter composite, the immaterial form, acts from the inside on the matter. It is what the thing is. So for example, a falling chip of iron veers from its path because we later find there's a magnetic field that acts on the outside of it. Phys physicists then include the law of magnetic action into the law of the general law laws that we know of and eventually into the Maxwell's equations. Metaphorically, one can say then that the intellect becomes a new law of the behavior of the physical parts. The action of the will violates the causality only if one confines causality to causes proceeding only from material things. In the same way, you could say that the magnet acting on the iron violated causality if you excluded the magnet as part of physical things. But in this case, if you exclude um, the immaterial, then you're excluding a cause that's really there, and so you're going to end up misassociating it. You're going to end up saying that, it, that it's a violation when really it's not. The will does not move bodies in a way that obviates the need for the sensitive and the material powers. On the contrary, each higher power presupposes and works through the lower power. If it were to violate them, it would not be making use of them as they are, and it will be to its own detriment. We don't have the ability to levitate, to just go like that and have your mind operate on something far away. That would violate physics. The, immater the immaterial laws augment the physical laws. They don't undo them. They work through them. So the physical laws, I have to walk over there and touch it. The Im so this is an important point. The immaterial versus the material. This is a sort of a correction in the our improper knowledge. We tend to think of something as supernatural when it's immaterial. In fact, this is not supernatural versus natural. God is the only thing that's supernatural. All else is natural in the sense of being a part of nature. We're a part of nature 
in the in the in the general use of the word in the most general use of the word nature. Uh, everything in nature has a potentiality and, and a separate actuality, essence and existence combination, if you will. God, who is who is, he has no shadow of non-being. He is complete. We said that, and we'll see this more in chapter 8. But his essence is his existence. There's no separation. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that more in the next chapter. But this is what the difference is. Uh, creatures are that which have this essence existence combination and God and supernatural is everything else that is God himself which is where existence and essence are the same so the, di the difference is in, in kind of broadening our mindset and remembering that the immaterial is a part of the working of nature we shouldn't think of it as a violation it's part of the whole of creation one part made to work relative to another part and we'll see we talk, we're saying a lot of things about God now that we, we won't prove here, but we will in, in chapter 8. And we'll, we'll even say more in chapter 7 that we, that we haven't uh, proved. But we have proved his existence, so we'll go from, from what we know of that, the little that we know of that, because we'll need it in a lot of this. So, so the, going back to our, our, our will, the will, again, it acts as a part of nature. It's the immaterial part, so it can't be um, uh, limited, so it's only a violation, as we said, if we limit the world to just the material causes. But, you know, scientists know this, and when scientists does an experiment, for example, he doesn't let you in his lab. And if you go in his lab and start fiddling this with equipment, he won't like you very much. Because he fixes certain conditions, he minimizes the temperature, he fixes the material things, and he wants the immaterial things left out as much as he can. He deliberately leaves them out. So, um, we're aware of these things. We don't want action of people's free will in our experiments because we're trying to look at material causality in those experiments. But the point is, is that we want to, in the will, it's going to minimally violate these laws. Even though when the will is present, it's going to minimally violate these laws in order to make most of use, use of those laws. Violate's not a good word because the action of the material just is a much a part of nature as the, anything else. So again, we want to be careful that we, because the universe, to the degree that it is, is unified. One part existing and relative to the other part acting on the other thing. If one part has a, no place in the universe, it's really not a part of the universe. In other words, it doesn't have a, a being. To the degree that it isn't unified, it's not a being. Um, and, and I give an example that you should read um, and get as much out of as you can if you're not into the sciences, it may be tough, but it will give you an example of how, the, how I think one, ex one way the, these things could happen with the electrons and minimally violate are the known laws of physics. So what about a specialized experiment to, to look for, the, detect the immaterial? To try to see the, the action of the immaterial soul in an atom, say, or a group of atoms. This is a silly thing to do, because first of all, life is an organism. Remember what an organism is, organized. It comes from a similar word of the word organized. It's a complex, eminent organization of heterogeneous parts. It is a relation among the parts, not found among, in, among the individual parts. So it's a heterogeneous, a, a bunch of heterogeneous parts ordered towards eminent action of the whole. We already know the intellect is in a material form from its effects. We don't need to do any experiments. We already know this, without doubt. To demand it be forced into a part is like trying to strain an elephant through the kitchen sieve and still thinking that it'll remain an elephant. Man's substantial form, and what else can we say about this? So we, we've now you know, shown that the physical has to be part of man's nature and that, that the intellect and the sensorial powers and so on make use of, minimally violate, if you will. Better said, they are a whole, acting together, one on the other. The law of the sensorial power becomes a new law of raising the vegetative and so on. So what can we say more about the substantial form of man now that we've got th this much under our belt? Normally in uh, form matter composites, when the form is taken out, the matter is lost. 
We said this. Remember, if I eat the apple, now it's an apple. I eat a part of the apple. The apple becomes part of me. An apple uh, or an animal dies. An animal form is lost and replaced by non-living things. So in this case, the form of the apple was lost. In the other case, the form of the animal was lost. What happens in the case of man? We have to look form and existence to really tackle this problem. The, we call the, the primary act of being the S in Latin. The act of being is the form. The form is what makes a thing to be what it is. It's through the fact that this, there's a form activating this matter that makes the matter an apple. The, mat, the form is nothing but what the appleness of the apple. Remember, everything is what it is. What it is, that's the, the, the substantial form. New forms are only incidental, incidentally destructible. Forms of themselves are immaterial. Remember, we abstract the form. The form of itself is immaterial, having no parts. It's the matter that's extended. The matter is one part here and the other part there. A cat has his head here and his tail there, so I can rip him apart because he's extended. But immaterial things have no parts. The first accident of material things is extension. And so, as a form, it's immaterial. But a substantial form which is tied in all ways to the immaterial will obviously be lost once it's separated from the material. So an apple of its very existence involves being connected with matter. And so while the form can exist in a referential way in my mind, it cannot have an external existence outside my mind as appleness. It has to become a particular apple and the, the, then thereby taken on matter. So the form po matter composite um, comes into being. But a substantial form which is not tied to necessarily to material things is, is a different case. Man's substantial form is such a form. Man's substantial form is subsistent. We've seen man's substantial form has acts that do not in principle, in principle depend on the soul. I mean, that, that, that do not in principle tend, depend on the matter. It is purely immaterial having some acts dependent, not dependent on the material. Hence, at the death of the body, loses its substantial form, but the reform remains because unlike the body, it cannot be ripped apart. So the substantial form, which is the be of the, of the matter, when that leaves the matter, the matter um, loses its form, of course, and takes on the form of a carcass, whatever substances are in a carcass. But the substantial form of the man can't be ripped apart. It's immaterial, meaning not having extension, not changeable. So the soul cannot die. The immaterial substantial form of man, it's evident that it cannot die once you understand that the immaterial substantial form of man is qualitatively different than other substantial forms. But wait a second. Didn't we say that man couldn't think without his body? So what are we talking about? How are we saying that, that there's a part of man that's not dependent on matter when we said he is dependent on matter. Well, no, that's not what we really said. We said in a severely damaged body, he could not think. Once the separation happens, the mode of existence of the man goes from the proper form matter composite into a purely spiritual existence. It is no longer hindered by the body, but that yet it's, a for, it's still a substantial form belonging to a form matter composite. So it's still deprived of natural functions, and it's pretty severe deprivation. One thing you'll notice right off the bat, without access to sensorial knowledge, without access to phantasms, which get lost with the material, um, you can't abstract any new ideas. More than that, you won't know any particulars. All the particulars that you knew in this life, you will not know, separated from the body. You'll have this potential relation, this relation still established with the body, but the body is gone, so you will not know particulars. You will not be able to communicate to anyone except God. Now, um, of course, God can supply all these things by special ideas to, to, so that you could know particulars. But in and of itself, you're in this funny state where you're free to, to act, to, for your spirit to act, your soul to act in, in a way where it's not encumbered in, a way, in one way, but in another way it's very encumbered. And let me give you, go back to our metaphor of the man in the car. Remember we said the body, soul, the, the form matter composite of man is like a car being the body and the substantial form being the man. Remember the chief power of substantial form is the intellect. And we said motion is like the use of the intellect. Well, the driver car system. Now we should note that the driver car system is 
a contrivance. It's not a real substance in the sense that man is a real substance. So this is part of what happens when you use a metaphor. But the car driver system, it's still none nonetheless a good metaphor. Remember that it, while I can drive and I can have complete driver man system uh, capabilities, it, but if my car gets in an accident, you know, to the degree that the, it hurt the car is the degree I, maybe I can't turn anymore. But if the car gets completely destroyed so it can't move at all, well then I'm stuck. Now if it gets to the point where the car is completely irreparable, then the man has to get out of the car. And you've destroyed the man-driver system. Notice the potential relationship still obtains between the car, man, between the soul body. But now the man is free, but he's also more... Uh, very confined, he can't move like he could at all. He, but he can do things he couldn't do before. He can go down alleys, he can climb up steep hills. But you notice that the driver car system is destroyed. And um, he still maintains this reference to the driver car system, and uh, he's lost something substantial in, in losing the matter. So that's an analogy to help you work through, but you should always go back to the deep thinking. It's the thinking that matters, not the images. That is an image to help you think about the fact that man has an immaterial substantial form that is part of a form matter composite and that form matter composite is him. He is not either just a matter or just a substantial form, he is a form matter composite. But that form that he has is an immaterial substantial form, not material. Since we talked about the end of the soul, the end of man's substantial form, what about the beginning? Let's start with animals because animals are simpler to understand. Animal's life begins at the union of a sperm and an egg. Why is this? Well, because at the, that point, it has, in a hidden way, um, what it will become. But before we get into that and, and say that, that the animal's life begins there, let's just start with the animal zygote. No one would deny that this animal zygote is a living organism. But they will, the question they'll ask is that, well, it's a living organism, but is a living what? So our burden is to prove what it is. So we're going to need a new principle, a princi another self-evident principle called the principle of causality. And the principle of causality is nothing uh, but the fact that nothing reduces itself from potentiality to act. Something can act only insofar as it is in act. Something can act only insofar as it is in act. Nothing can change itself, is a sort of brief way of saying this. We'll also need to remember what an organism is. An organ, organism is an organization of ordering of various parts, a, related, a, a, a relation among heterogeneous parts ordered towards an imminently acting whole. So now, wh what does this principle of causality mean? Well, Let's, let's say something changed itself. Well, what would that mean? If something's changing itself, it means it's giving itself something that it doesn't have. Well, it can't do that. That's a contradiction with the, the, the first principle we came up with, is the principle of contradiction, which is nothing can be and not be at the same time and in the same way. So, uh, the principle of causality is self-evident. This is then the proof that a zygote is an animal. Right, right at the beginning when those sperm and egg come together, it's, a, it's an animal. That's because the efficient cause, and let me give it a, a new definition here. An efficient cause is something that causes something to change. It's basically an agent that acts from the outside to change something. If a zygote is not already, already an animal, but becomes one uh, at some point, then something outside of it must have the actuality to make it an animal. Yet, there is no such cause outside of it. Modern biology has shown that the mother's role in, in an animal is totally passive. Nothing, no new information is given from animal, from the, zyg from the mother to the zygote. Well, you may say, well, maybe the zygote provides its own efficient cause, but this is precisely what the pr principle of causality says you can't do. If this statement is to not violate the principle of causality, the zygote must be two things, not one thing. But we've already said it's an organism. That's the first thing we had in the last slide. An organism means that it's an organized whole. So the zygote is an animal right from the beginning or it never would become one. Better said, animal life begins at conception. 
It must be the law of its own development. It must be hidden what it is, must be what it is, is to become in a hidden way already at the moment of conception. The re same reasoning for the same logic without exception goes through for um, human zygotes except one issue and that is that um, the important distinction between creation and making. Remember we said material things have this extensive, this quality, this ability of, of this actuality of being extended, I should say. And the actuality of being extended is what makes it changeable because I can rip this thing in half because part of it's here and part of it's there. Uh, and I can also put it together because it's extended and I can make other things out of it. So that's what we call making. I can actuate, actualize potentials in things and make them something other than what they are. Whereas something that's immaterial does not have this quality of being changeable. It's not physical. It's non-physical. It's not a form matter composite. It doesn't have this extension. So they are simple and have no parts. So you can't put an immaterial substantial form or anything immaterial together. It's a whole. It's, a, it's whatever it is. Remember, we, we talked about that in, in both sensorial knowledge had an element of it, and in intellectual knowledge it was pure immaterial. So the, for a man's substantial form being purely immaterial cannot be made. It must be put from the outside. So, there, so God, or, or some, something, we'll, know, we'll later see that it's God, but something must put the zygote from the, the, put the soul in the man at some point. And this is what happens at the moment of the uh, union of the sperm and the egg, because the, their, their matter now is disposed towards the reception of a substantial form, an immaterial substantial form that is man. And so the, you could say that the soul, that the disposition of the matter calls for the infusion of a soul. The point here is, is that this is a law set up by God as part of uh, human nature of, of human nature and the nature of the physical world all put together in one, that when the material world comes to this point that there's this uh, disposition of the matter is such that you have the um, matter of calling for a substantial form of a man that the substantial form of the man is put there by God. And that will happen every time you have matter disposed in that way. The next question that will help us understand some of these issues, I think, a little bit better is um, the question that we asked at the beginning, can, I, can we make life? Can we create animals? And create, again, is used here in an equivocal way because create means to make from nothing, the way immaterial things have to be made. I really, need, I really mean not create, but make, put together. Can we put together matter to make animals? It appears we can because animals are, made, are, are bound to the material. And you can make material things. You can put together material things. Now there, and what does that mean? That means actuating forms. That means you have material things of which you've activated, activated various um, potentialities in their forms. And um, the technical problems are a separate issue. Again, uh, creating generally means from nothing. We're not doing that here. We're talking about making, uh, reducing potentialities to act. Can we make a man? So, so let me let's emphasize this. So it looks like, barring technical problems, there's no reason why you can't make a, an animal. Can we make a man? Arguments apply exactly as previously, except man has an immaterial substantial form that cannot be made. But it can be called for. It will be called for once the matter is properly disposed. So once the matter reaches the point that... Um, it, it, the, it is disposed for an immaterial substantial form, it'll get it. So let's take a case of this. This is um, not too different from cloning, but um, it has a sort of more directness about it than cloning does. Suppose we, somebody were to make an identical copy of you, not as a zygote, but as a full-grown man. And a line, you know, took you atom by atom. You know, there's now the potential, the ability to take atoms and, and build crystals one by one. Let's say that you're able to put all the atoms in the right order. And once you got that one right atom lined up so that it was identical with you in your current state, what would happen? Well, once, once that last atom was put in, in so that the material was, the potentiality was activated so that 
the matter was disposed, there would be an immortal soul infused by God, created by God and infused by God, so that that thing at that moment becomes a man. But it would, he would have memories, but memories that he would not have accessed yet. Don't forget, he just came into existence. So he would have sensorial memories that would have to be activated by his sensorial knowledge. So phantasms would come about. And by those phantasms, he would be like looking in a picture book of somebody else's life. It would be a horrifying way to begin existence. And he would just gradually start to figure it out as he abstracted from these sensorial knowledge. It would be a quite confused and awful way to begin life, showing us how careful we have to be with what we do and what we, what we choose to do and what we choose not to do. Now, let's move on. We'll come back to these discussions later, but for now, let's move on to talk about robots. Can robots think? No. We already know the answer to that because the intellect is immaterial. It cannot be made. We cannot, there is no way you can make out of material things something that's immaterial because immaterial things are, have no extension and material things do. So the intellect is immaterial and cannot be made. Recall that made means to, just to inform different matter, and material things have no matter. So we can't inform different matter to make material things. It's one of those qualitatively different steps. You can get arbitrarily close by making a better and better sensorial creature, assuming those potentialities are there in the matter, but you cannot make a man because a man has an immaterial substantial form. In that, in that sense, you can't make a man. Turing um, came up with a test to say, well, look, if, how do I know if I have artificial intelligence? He came up with a test. And basically, the test is this. Let's say you had a screen, and you had a, a, a man on one side of the screen, and you had something else on the other side of the screen, say a robot or a computer or something. And the Turing's test was, if the man could be fooled into thinking that the, guy, the thing on the other side of the screen was a man, then you've created intelligence. But of course, that, that's nothing to do with whether you have an intellect or not. An intellect is a matter of existence, an actual factual existence. Either you have one or you don't. Whether something can be fooled by you is a separate question. And to bring this home, you know, if you have a painting, just because it looks like you doesn't mean it is you. Or even a 3D representation with motion added and as much else would not make it a man. In the same way, just because something can imitate um, the, a man even to, to fool someone doesn't mean it is, has the uh, intelligence, does have the intellect of a man. Indeed, robots, by definition, aren't even life because they have no eminent activity. They are functional replicas. Remember, we've already talked about exact replicas. We've said what happens with exact replicas. We're now talking about functional replicas, which is deliberately made to imitate something rather than to be something. Appearance is what a robot designer is after. He doesn't want a man, but the electromechanical equivalent that acts like him. This, guy, this thing may even pass the Turing test. It doesn't make it a rational animal. It has to have ideas to make it a rational animal. It's not even an animal. Organisms, remember, are heterogeneous parts ordered towards the whole, and it's eminent to activity. Heterogeneous refers to the fact that one cannot take one part of an organism, and, I mean, one can take one part of an organism, and it'll be much different than another part. Um, by contrast, uh, material things that you use in creating a robot, or just material things in general, for example, take a sugar, cube of sugar. If I chop little pieces off a cube of sugar, then those little pieces will look qualitatively similar to the bigger piece. And if I chop those up, they'll look qualitatively similar to the bigger piece. That's because the cube of sugar is, is homogeneous, not heterogeneous. So heterogeneity and order go hand in hand. Your hand is not composed of little hands. It's composed in flesh and blood and cells. And the cells aren't composed of little cells. They're composed of organelles and so on. My mitochondria aren't composed of other... Mitochondria. The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell that converts, gives energy to the cell. Heterogeneous parts allow complex uh, uh, relations to be obtained among a whole. And that, that those complex relations among the parts ordered toward the whole is what makes the living thing a living thing. It's what differentiates that substantial form from the substantial form of, of a dead thing. This ordering of parts toward the whole is an instance of what we call final causality. Each part makes no sense outside of the whole because each part 
has its reason for being that in that place in reference to the rest of the organism. So if I take a heart out and try to analyze the heart and refuse to let myself think about the hole that it came from, the heart makes no sense because the whole point of the heart is to feed blood to different parts of the body. So the parts of an organism have an end, which is the whole. This is somewhat mysterious, but true. And remember, we have to keep in mind that even when we get against something that is pushing our limits of understanding, we don't give it up. If it's true, it's true. We just try to understand it. Final cause is seen even in physics. In Newtonian physics, you have the case if I take this ball and I throw the ball, it will go, it'll go a certain way. If I take a rock, this ball and throw it into a pond or a rock and throw it into a pond, if I do it under the same circumstances, it'll act in the same way. There's an order there that will obtain, there's a potenti order, the potentiality there is ordered towards a certain actuality. Not all our actuality, just a particular actuality. This ordination implies a foreordination. Ordination is there before the reduction of potentiality to act. In other words, because of the fact that when I throw this ball, it always behaves in the same way under the same circumstances, there has to be, have been an order already established so that that potentiality would, would be to, to do that specific thing rather than another specific thing. And we'll talk about the final cause more later. So robots are imi imitations of this final causality. We see this final causality and we say, let's imitate this. They're, eminent, they're not eminent order, they're externally imposed order. We start off with the idea of something that has parts ordered to one another and to make a whole. However, we choose to use already made substances rather than activate potentiality in matter. We choose to make um, use of substances that are already there. So for example, we use a metal rod in the camshaft. The metal rod gets decomposed into littler metal rods. and, and um, we use a can shaft and we hook them together. So this is an external ordering not that um, makes use of substances that already exist rather than activating potentialities to create new substances. Robots then are not living things. Robots can thus not have true sensorial knowledge because true sensorial knowledge depends on having this or heterogeneous ordering of parts beforehand. Similarly, they are only artificially intelligent, not actually intelligent, just artificially intelligent. So finally, we, we've, come, we've come quite a way here talking about robots, animals, men. What about, are there other forms of intelligence? Well, you know, there's much talk about aliens on other planets. This is possible. There's no reason why there couldn't be other um, material forms that are, have substantial, immaterial substantial forms. Um, but we have no evidence of this. There's no evidence whatsoever of this. Are there other possibilities? Yes, there certainly is. Man is a sort of a hybrid. We notice that he has one leg in the, in the water, if you will, of the world, and the other leg of the immaterial, the spiritual. He's sort of an amphibian, ha living one half in the material world and one half in the immaterial world. And the half of the immaterial world is, is the activity of his knowledge end, and the other half is the activity of his, his um, uh, living, and I mean, his vegetative powers and his um, physical powers. Uh, so what about a creature that isn't an amphibian like that? What about a creature that's purely immaterial? Color purely immaterial beings? Well, what makes us tied to matter? The thing that makes us tied to matter is that we need to abstract our ideas from phantasms. We need our sensorial knowledge. To, we need to first contact things through our senses. We said everything comes through our senses. What about a creature that didn't need to get its ideas from sensorial knowledge? What about a creature that had its ideas innately inside of it as it was created? Such creatures have been called by Christianity, Islam, and Judaism angels. And, but we can say a lot of them about these potential existent things called, that we'll call angels based on reason. For example, each angel must be its own species. Why is that? Well, how do you tell the difference between this dog and that dog. Well, that dog's a different color than that dog. That dog's here and that dog's there. Well, with angels, they have no material, char they have no material characteristic. We've said that. That's what, what, um, why we introduced them. And so there's only thing that could distinguish them is their substantial form. And now, in this case, their substantial form is not tied to matter. There is not a form-matter composite. They're a pure, immaterial, substantial form. 
And so they can only be distinguished by what they are, not by the matter that they inform. So, and so that's one thing you can say right off the bat. Each angel would have to be in a separate species, differentiated by what it is. And now, and the levels of an angel would be determined by what ideas it has. The simpler and bigger ideas it has, the more the, the angel would be. The more power, the more it would be because the more unified. So by two or three ideas, a really powerful angel could comprehend everything. Whereas a lesser angel would need multiple ideas. And to picture this, you might think of um, uh, a, like a four, four by eight photograph. If you got to see the photograph cut in half, you could put it together pretty easily. But if you had to see the picture cut in 10 pieces and look at each of the pieces separately, it's a little bit harder. So an angel, a higher angel, gets to have the bigger view of things, whereas a lower angel would have um, more trouble, but still be infinitely above us in their abilities, intellectual abilities, because not being tied to matter, they could know particulars for one thing. Do they exist? We'll see that in the next chapters. The point here to bring home is if Descartes would have thought more about angels, he would have not fell into the error that he fell into because he would have realized the distinction between us and angels is the fact that we have to use sensorial knowledge, whereas they don't. We've got a lot of new proper knowledge here. We found out what animals and plants are, what life is. We found about, uh, more about man, including the immortality of his substantial form and that, that he's a unity of form matter and that man's life begins at conception, and animal life begins at conception. We found out more about the nature of animals, including that you can make them. And we found more about things such as robots. So, what, what, one, most of what we've done here is used, or a good part of what we've done here is used our common experience again, rigorously examined, to bring out philosophical facts. But we've also started bringing the specialized sciences. And they started to call for the specialized sciences more and more. We saw that in the case of the uh, animal intelligence, where we had to go and look at uh, some of the investigations in animal psychology. And we also saw that and when we talked about the human zygotes. We, we had to uh, access modern biology. So we're starting to have to call into the modern specialized sciences in some cases. Um, before we really can understand all what all of our the things that we have learned in, up to this point and put it in context with the things we've learned with modern science through our education and, and other areas in our in our education we have to place uh, this knowledge within its scope and that's what we're going to do in the next chapter we're going to find out where philosophy fits in where all the different specialized sciences fit, fit in and then um, finally we have to investigate to see um, where, how these findings fit together once we have that uh, uh, sort of general layout, lay of the land. And after that, in chapter seven, what we'll do is we'll look at the specialized sciences, in particular physics, which is sort of the foundational one because it's the first one, and uh, see what kind of things, what kind of errors we can unwind and what we can understand about those sciences and what their place is. But first, we'll talk about Galileo and St. Thomas, and then giving the specialized sciences, that'll be next lecture.